Hello, I'm Elin from Mayo Clinic, and I am here with Dr. Susan Trudell from Princess Margaret, Dr. Fred Locke from Moffitt, and Dr. Krina Patel from MD Anderson. And we are here for day three of IWCAR-T, where we covered a lot of grounds in two major heme malignancies, where we have both FDA-approved CAR-T and lots of investigations. So first, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Locke. Please uh, give us some highlights of all the topic that we're discussing lymphoma. Yeah, so this has been a great IWCAR-T meeting, and it was really exciting today to, to have the uh, lymphoma session where David Maloney and I um, chaired the session. We had lots of great talks. We talked uh, about the pivotal trial data, um, or more specifically, the, the randomized controlled trials on third line setting for large B cell lymphoma, excuse me, second line setting, randomized phase three trials, and really exciting data. I mean, the, the results show that CAR T in the second line setting can improve outcomes. Event free survival is better um, for patients who get CAR-T in the second line. Um, it's better than the existing standard of care, which was chemotherapy followed by transplant. Uh, we also heard about follicular lymphoma and maybe could we even potentially be curing follicular lymphoma. Um, we talked quite a bit about why CAR-T doesn't work for all patients in lymphoma. We talked about mantle cell lymphoma results. So it was really, um, and, and, and a, quite a bit more, it was really a stimulating discussion, so. Excellent, lots of practice changing <laughs> discussions and yeah, more data to come. So in, in the myeloma session, we also started off with Ida cell and Silta cell that are both FDA approved and um, that uh, the studies where they're moving on to earlier lines, uh, we saw some clinical prognostic factors that may be associated with response uh, with these CAR-T. And um, for the first time, we heard some real-world data from Moffitt, uh, and there will be data coming in at ASCO as well from a number of institutions in the use of IDASEL in standard of care practice. So that is um, very interesting, particularly considering we haven't had as much good fortunes in, in standard of uh, care practice in terms of slot access as we've had in lymphoma. So some discussion about, you know, how to try to select patients um, for those. But so related to that, we heard some perhaps some opportunities for a next generation CAR-T investigation that, you know, might help overcome some of the challenges that we're seeing in CAR-T and in particular for Dr. Patel, would you like to give us some highlights in the discussion about allogeneic CAR-T in myeloma space? Yeah, so I think as you alluded to, uh, you know, not only slot envy that we have of lymphoma, as Nina had said, um, we have this plateau envy, so how can we, you know, improve that? And I think um, that's a whole other segment that hopefully next year we'll have a lot more translational data to talk about. But in terms of slots, not only the patients who can't get a slot right now, but we have, if you look at the intention to treat, there are patients who can't make cells, um, who can't get to an auto CAR T. And so having an off the shelf allo product makes sense. Um, and different than the bispecifics, which I know we'll talk about too, it's still a one and done. So that's sort of the advantage that you get that one and done, but it's still off the shelf. Um, so the Allogene 715 trial that Sham Malankoti um, presented uh, shows a great response rate, 71%. So, you know, small number of patients still, um, but they were able to give cells within, you know, I think five days for some patients and really didn't see ICANs uh, or any neurotoxicity and definitely not graft versus host, which people kind of worry about with aloe. Um, so we'll, we're waiting for the PFS um, at the higher dose levels um, and looking at their different lymphodepletion because again, I think compared to autocartes, aloes have, uh, you know, they're, they're more likely to get um, rejected, and so the lymphodepletion question is still there, which then comes to the trial that I presented with UCART CS1. So here you have a different antigen, uh, CS1, that's expressed on lots of myeloma, but unfortunately is also expressed on NK, other T cells, B cells. And so lymphodepletion there, we learned that maybe we didn't have to have as high of a lymphodepletion because those cells in the two patients that um, did expand and had a great response, unfortunately, they expanded really fast and caused HLH and other toxicities that you know um, um, the patients unfortunately succumbed to. So now we're redoing the trial at a lower lymphodepletion and hoping that the expansion happens a little bit over time um, and those cells maybe persist and, and give us a better PFS, but we'll hopefully have more data in the next year. 
Very interesting. And you know, allocarte has certainly been looked upon as one opportunity to have something more readily available to our patients. Um, still a lot of science you know, to be investigated behind that. And bispecific is another opportunity for um, you know, something that is more readily off the shelf. And in myeloma, we're fortunate to have data not only in BCMA, but other targets as well. So Dr. Trudeau, would you like to give us a summary of what was discussed? Yeah, I mean, it's very exciting. I mean, we first talked about uh, teclistamab, which is, uh, my understanding is that it's uh, going through review with the FDA and hopefully will be approved sometime this year and then give the patients another opportunity for BCMA targeted therapy in addition to the ADCs and the CAR-T and, and, and an off the shelf product and then certainly the results are still not fully mature but certainly response rates are high and so far the progression free survival is not yet reached and suggests that it may be you know in line with what we might see with some CAR T cell products um, I mean time will tell and also obviously we have to take into account that populations may be different but the results are, are very encouraging um, and then we also talked about other targets because as we know unfortunately unlike our lymphoma colleagues we have not reached the plateau and we're not seeing cures as of yet for most patients. Um, and so we need alternatives to targeting BCMA. So we talked about teclitumab, which is targeting GPCR6, five, sorry, and it's uh, showing activity as well, you know, high, high response rates, uh, very manageable toxicity profile with uh, low-grade CRS and ICANs, um, including responses or, uh, I shouldn't say responses because that data wasn't presented, but at least some of the patients, a third of the patients enrolled in the study had had prior BCMA. So encouraging that we will see responses with this new target um, in that patient population. And then I specifically spoke about uh, Savostamab, which is another bispecific that targets FC receptor H5. Um, again, this differs from the BCMA uh, target in that it's expressed um, through multiple uh, uh, lineages of BCMA cells. Um, in addition, it's not uh, secreted, so we don't have issues with soluble levels and drug sink effects. Um, so in those studies, again, we showed um, at the higher doses, uh, overall response rates around 60%, very uh, manageable uh, CRS, almost exclusively grade 1, 2, and similarly with ICANN, so a good safety profile. Uh, for that uh, bispecific, and it looks like we're uh, seeing durable responses. And again, that study had about a third of the patients that uh, had had prior BCMA. So it looks very opportun uh, opportunistic that we will have additional drugs that we can use in our patients who are getting what's probably now being considered the fourth pillar of myeloma therapy, anti-BCMA targeted therapies. Yeah. So we anticipate having um, FDA review and hopefully approval for um later this year. So we would have another option in the clinic. Um, what are you guys' thoughts in terms of how you might consider patients for you know, teclistamab versus BCMA CAR-T, assuming you have access to both? Right, so that's what I was going to say at the beginning. It's going to be all my patients that are on a list waiting for a CAR-T are likely going to get the bispecific. And, you know, um, as we get more slots, I think for us, um, it's really going to be those patients, hopefully in this next six months to a year, we'll have more data to say who are the patients that really are optimal for CAR-T in terms of their cells, manufacturing, um, especially fourth after fourth line. It, it's, it's a lot harder for these patients you know, to, to get to CAR-T, make cells, and then have disease that still responds without horrible toxicity because their disease is exploding. So I think Hopefully, we'll, we'll have some data on which patients to sort of select, but I think right now we're, we're just, we have so many patients that need therapy and it's great to have these. We're trying to get whatever we can for them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would agree completely with what you said. I think as, as we get more and more data about who, who are the patients who do really well with CAR-T, um, you know, those patients I think would be certainly be patients that we'd preferably put on CAR-T. Um, and then, you know, who are those patients who can't wait for the manufacturing? At this point in time, we're still 
not readily available to get rapid uh, rapid products out. So you know those are the patients who might go on a bispecific, and then there are patients who may just opt for one choice over the other, who may want care closer to home uh, as opposed to relocating for a month to a, an academic center for CAR T, for example, or may not have the supports to manage to get through a CAR T cell. So it's, it'll be lovely for the patients to have those uh, choices available. Yeah. So Dr. Locke, you know, we heard real world data was mantle cell lymphoma, it was took um, Brexa cell, and also some emerging data with Ida cell in real world. And it was very encouraging to hear despite, um, you know, more than half, right, 75 uh, more percent of the patient who would not have met registration trial requirement, those patients still seem to have done well mm -hmm. uh, with these CAR T in the real world. You've talked a little bit about, you know, the in the second line setting with the positive study and, you know, how would this gets adopted in the practice. And it's something we discuss a lot, you know, in terms of, oh gosh, you know, Will you take on the patient that wouldn't have been on a Zuma 7 study um, for CAR-T in a second line setting? And so, and then also, you know, we've seen some data in first line setting too that may be potentially practice changing lymphoma. Do you foresee that potentially changing the patient population being considered for earlier use of, you know, Axacel in, in lymphomas? Yeah, I, I think the, the results are really um, clear that uh, CAR T cell therapy can work for patients with refractory disease and as we move it up earlier and earlier uh, lines of therapy we're actually seeing um, slightly better durable response rates not not wildly better um, but we're also as we move it up into earlier lines of therapy actually pre-selecting the sort of patients most likely to do poorly with chemotherapy so I think um, we'd like to broaden that and, and sort of treat more patients earlier. Uh, the label for Axcaptogene Cellulosal was updated to allow for second line therapy in those who progress within 12 months of initial treatment, frontline treatment. So that means that there's a whole uh, number of patients who are going to be in the, you know, relapsing more than 12 months who will not be on the FDA label and we won't be able to use it most likely. But um, I think that also you mentioned the real world data, whether it be for, you know, Axcaptogene Cellulosal or Rexcaptogene. Um, or IDSL, we're seeing that we are able to administer CAR T cell therapy to patients who maybe have comorbidities or um, wouldn't have been perfect trial candidates, but we're able to collect cells, we're, we're able to get them CAR T cells, and, and the results are equal and in some cases uh, even better than the pivotal trials because um, these patients um, may have more of a, um, a relapsed disease phenotype, at least in large B cell lymphoma, as opposed to a refractory um, um, disease phenotype. And I think, um, you know, that 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 uh, disease um, difference actually impacts CAR T cell response as well. So we're just excited that that we have CAR T cell therapy for our patients, and and we encourage referring providers to refer the the patients in and. You know, it's unfortunate about the myeloma CAR-T that we can't treat enough patients, um, but I'm excited that there's going to be some of these bispecific options. Um, but, we, you know, we're, it's clear that the results are, are impressive with IDSL. You know, you, you guys talk about the, um, you know, the, the envy, the, the, what is it, the plateau, the plateau envy. envy. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I mean, like, look, the, the, these are patients who really are without other good treatment options. I have patients who are eight months, nine months out of, of standard of care CAR T cell therapy for myeloma who are cruising around the world. They've never gone without therapy for eight months in 15 years. I mean, so, I mean, it's pretty remarkable um, treatment opportunity. So, so we hope that we can give it to more of our patients soon. Absolutely. Right. Well, thank you everyone for sharing your data. Any last thoughts or things you're looking forward to for, for this coming year until we meet again for IW23? Well, I think I'm looking forward to seeing some of the combination data that will be coming out with uh, um, with the bispecifics, tar you know, combining with IMIDS and, and DARA to see how the, the tolerability and, and the efficacy data from those studies and then learning more from the correlative studies from the CAR-Ts and not trying to understand a bit more about who fails, who does well um, to better inform our treatment decisions. 
Yeah, I agree. Why are patients not um, having optimal responses to CAR-T? How are we going to sequence the bispecifics in CAR-T cell therapy, or how are we going to choose those patients? And then do the allogeneic CAR-T cells work particularly for myeloma because we, we're not able to, to give enough autologous CAR-T. So looking forward to it. Yeah, and I think I can just add the, the real world data for myeloma. You know, we're just starting with that and I think having a second product now to be able to look at um, responses and toxicity, et cetera, is gonna be very telling. Um, and then how to sequence all of this that, you know, we're, we're getting all these new treatments and wonderful um, opportunity but I don't know which target to use when, or you know, the combination, which ones are gonna be the best. So I think that translational data that hopefully we'll, we'll be getting from all the CAR-Ts and bispecifics will hopefully help with that. Yes, that would be a good problem we would like to have, <laughs> and more work to do. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you. Thank you.